Caligula. The Corruption of Power by Anthony A. Barrett Forward. The Emperor Commodus is said to have put a man to death simply for reading Suetonius's Life of Caligula. The punishment may seem excessive, but it is probably safe to say that of all the emperors of ancient Rome, none, with the possible exception of Nero, surpasses Caligula's reputation for infamy, and Nero, it must be pointed out, had fourteen years to perfect his image against Caligula's modest four. The quintessential mad despot. Caligula has inspired plays, films, several series for television. Yet while the public at large seems to find him irresistible, academic biographers have attended to give him a wide berth. Nor is this surprising. The loss of the relevant books of most important ancient commentator on the Julio-Claudian period, the historian Tacitus, means that we have to rely for our information on markedly inferior sources, in particular the late historian Dio and the biographer Suetonius. Their evident bias is not the main problem. Scattered references to Caligula made by Tacitus in the context of other emperors made it clear that his account must have been no less hostile than those that have survived, and in any case allowance can always be made for prejudice. A much more serious difficulty is that much of the surviving material is anecdotal and trivial, often in the form of the emperor's intentions, rather than his actual deeds and generally presented with such little coherence that even a simple but reliable reconstruction of chronological events still largely eludes us. As a consequence, most surveys of Caligula's life, more popular on the continent than in the English-speaking world, have tended to avoid critical analysis and to limit themselves essentially to paraphrased selections of Suetonius and Dio. The biographical format imposes undeniable limitations on the serious study of any historical period, and it might well be asked why Caligula, of all emperors, should merit one in any case. His reign was exceptionally brief, shorter, for example, than those of Galerius, six years, or Crispus, nine or Licinius, the first and second, twenty-three between them, emperors who have suffered general neglect and whose names remain obscure. Moreover, he had no profound views on government as far as we can tell, and represents no major historical trend. There is, of course, a simple, immediate response to the question. Whether perversely or not, the literate reading public finds the life of Caligula interesting, while it stubbornly persists in showing a little or no interest in Probus, Galerius, or the like. Since the interest exists, it should be met by a sober study that takes account of up-to-date research and the latest archaeological developments. The result might be no more than the approximation of the actual events, more so than most political biographies, but it should at least be motivated by a serious attempt at academic truth, rather than by mere commercial sensationalism. Quite apart from the need to serve the lay public, however, it would be a mistake to dismiss Caligula's reign as historically insignificant. Events with far-reaching consequences occur in this period. Caligula formulated the plans for the conquest of Britain, put into effect by his successor two years later. His reign saw the first serious outbreak of anti-Semitism in the Roman world, 
most important of all, he was the first Roman emperor, in the full sense of the word, handed by a complacent senate almost unlimited powers over a vast section of the civilized world. The manner of his accession established a pattern that was to be repeated through the next four centuries. If Caligula teaches us any lesson, it is perhaps that history seems to teach us nothing. The Roman Senate soon came to regret that they had so enthusiastically handed over supreme power to a personable but totally inexperienced young man. Less than 15 years later, they went through almost the same ritual and endured under Nero an extended reprise of what they had already suffered. A biography should perhaps answer one basic question. What sort of person is its subject? Unfortunately, in the case of Caligula, this is not easy to answer. To the ancient sources, he was a destructive monster. The opportunistic philosopher Seneca, seeking to curry favor with the emperor Claudius, assured him that his predecessor had wasted and utterly destroyed the emperor. This is patently untrue. Under Caligula, the Roman provinces seemed to have enjoyed stable and orderly government. The frontiers were secure. The Romans had worked out a modus vivendi with their arch-rival Parthia, and the German incursions into Gaul had been stemmed. Also, it is clear that many individual senators did very well under Caligula, despite their desperate attempts to doctor the record afterwards. Even the most die-hard critics of Caligula will admit that there are some things that do not add up about our picture of his reign. He supposedly cut a ridiculous figure in leading his troops personally into battle. No emperor had taken to the field in over 50 years, yet two years after his death, Claudius repeated the gesture and rode out at the head of his army in Britain. Caligula supposedly left Rome utterly bankrupt. But again, his successor found the treasury so healthy that he could abolish taxes and engage in expensive building projects. Caligula is said to have the blood of his people on his hands. Certainly, the Inevitable repression that followed the series of plots against his life is presented with a vividness and gusto that creates the impression of a bloodbath. Yet the public reaction to his assassination was actually anger. Moreover, the list of his named victims is not a long one, and many of those on it do seem in prima facie evidence to have been involved in plotting against him. Could the ancient writers have distorted the record so seriously? One passage of Seneca is particularly telling. He describes how Caligula would offer his foot to be kissed, an abominable practice that struck at the very heart of Roman gravitas and dignitas. On this one occasion, and only this once, Seneca plays fair, and admits that this may not actually be what happened, that there are some who say that the emperor was only showing off his new slippers. This illustrates the enormous task facing the historian who must make sense from nonsense. If we were to throw out every anecdote about Caligula that looks suspect, we would be left with virtually no biography. The great problem is that where the archaeological record is missing also, there is no historiographical tools 
to enable us to sort out the gems from the dross. Beyond basic common sense and a feeling for what is reasonable, rather arbitrary and personal criteria, which scholars rightly view with some suspicion. Of course, many figures of the past have been badly treated by a hostile historical tradition, but Caligula's case is rather special. It must always be borne in mind that his successor Claudius found himself in a very sensitive position when he came to power. He had become emperor as a result of the incumbent's murder. To avoid setting a precedent, it was important for him to promote the notion that Caligula had died not because the imperial system was inherently evil, but because Caligula was an inherently evil emperor. Claudius himself, a historian, would have given other historians their lead. He would have been aided and abetted in this by the senatorial quislings, men who had done very well under Caligula, but who afterwards would have deemed it in their interest that the historical record should read how they had lived in constant peril of extermination, surviving only by their wits or by the luckiest twists of fate. It would be paranoid to suggest that there was a conspiracy to suppress the truth about Caligula. But at the least, there would have been a little incentive to expand on the few merits that he did possess. Glimpses of these merits are discernible from time to time in the sources, but they are faint indeed. The two serious analytical studies of his reign as a whole have sought to rectify the impression created by the sources, perhaps going too far the way in the process. going too far the other way in the process. H. Wilrick, whose work was published in a series of articles in 1903, saw in Caligula's actions a deliberate and coherent attempt to revert to the Caesarian concept of monarchy and a conscious decision to dismantle the artificial system evolved under Augustus, and rendered largely inoperative under Tiberius. Caligula, as a descendant of Anthony, was well suited for this role. His actions, as viewed by Wilrick, are rational and, in their own context, logical, the expression of a consistent political philosophy. Balsdens, the Emperor Gaius published some thirty years later, set out with a more modest and probably more acceptable thesis. To Bolston, Caligula was intelligent and consistent in his policies, if not always wise in his decisions. And the picture of him as a mad sadist is the result of a distortion by the sources. There is much that is attractive in Bolston's readable study, but, as will soon become apparent, on many points the present work takes issue with him. In his zeal to be fair to his subject, Bolston has perhaps been too charitable. This book was undertaken without party pre, and without preconceptions. Its primary aim has been to attempt a reconstruction of events. The historian's proper role, of course, is to look beyond the events themselves and to identify significant trends. But the opportunity for this is limited in Caligula's reign, since any broad generalization will have to depend often on reconstructions that are hypothetical, the process becomes hazardous, 
It has been speculated, for instance, that the conspiracy of AD 39 uh, might have been prompted by Caligula's marriage to Caesonia in the spring of that same year. This provokes speculation about the dynastic plans of some of the participants, perfectly valid, except it may well be that the marriage took place in the autumn, well after the conspiracy had been exposed, in which case, no matter how brilliant the insights, they will have been totally misdirected. This is a constant and frustrating difficulty of the period, which is not likely to disappear except with the discovery of the lost books of Tacitus's annals. In reconstructing events, I have attempted to resist excessive speculation. Where I have yielded is on some of the key points where the evidence is ambiguous and an author is obliged to take some stand, and where the currently received wisdom is itself based essentially on speculation. In particular, I have a little in detail to say about Caligula's mental state, since experts admit the immense difficulty even of person-to-person -person psychoanalyses, it seems to me is it seems to me a self-indulgence to attempt it over a gulf of some 2,000 years. And in any case, the subject will be systematically treated in Professor A. Farrell's projected psychological study of Caligula. I have also tried to resist the temptation to which many have succumbed in the past of building elaborate theories on the foundations of very casual allusions in the sources. The conclusions I have reached will surely be dismissed by some the inevitable fate of any biography of Caligula, but they are where the sources, both primary and secondary, seem to me most reasonably to be led. This is certainly not a revisionist study, and it does not attempt to rehabilitate Caligula. As an individual, he was intelligent, as Bolsden suggests, but he was also insufferably arrogant and totally wrapped up in his own sense of importance. He also seems to have lacked any basic sense of moral responsibility. He was quite unsuited either by temperament or training to rule an empire, and probably any one of the 600 or so senators would have done no worse. Unlike Bolsden and Wilrick, I see no consistency or coherence in his policies, and little administrative talent beyond an ability to choose subordinates who served him ably and while he was alive loyally. The traditional problem of Caligula's reign has been to explain why he descended into autocracy. In my view, the great mystery is not why things went wrong, but how any intelligent Roman could possibly have imagined that they could go otherwise. To make an inexperienced and almost unknown young man, brought up under a series of aged and repressive guardians, master of the world, almost literally overnight, on the sole recommendation that his father had been a thoroughly decent fellow, was to court disaster in a quite irresponsible fashion. The Romans may have resented the subsequent burden of autocracy, but it was an autocracy largely of their own making. In keeping with the tradition of the series of which it is a part, this book is intended to appeal to readers with a general interest in Roman imperial history, as well as to give the specialists some food for thought. To this end, Latin and Greek passages have generally been translated in the text, except where context or linguistic similarities make it unnecessary, and technical terms are explained except, again, where ignorance of them should not seriously hamper understanding of the narrative. 
For the benefit of the general reader, it must be emphasized that the illustrated sculpture has been identified by scholars in the past essentially on the basis of subjective judgment, and the attributions must be treated with some caution. Issues likely to be of interest only to the specialist are assigned to appendices at the ends of the chapters. Roman praenomena are given in their full forms in the text, and not normally in the footnotes. For the sake of clarity, the technicality, the technically incorrect name Herod, in quotes, Agrippa, is often used of the colorful Jewish ruler. Moreover, the distinctive Caligula, in quotes, rather than Gaius, in quotes, has been deliberately used on the grounds that in general, as opposed to narrowly academic practice, that is how perfectly sensible people refer to him, and that is how some of the ancient, albeit less familiar, sources, like Eutropius and Aurelius Victor, refer to him also. Bolsden refrained from using Caligula, on the grounds that the emperor found the name undignified and insulting. He thereby manifested an old-world courtesy, which I feel his subject had hardly merited, and which I do not try to emulate. For what it is worth, the same emperor, according to Seneca, was insulted to be called. For what it is worth, the same emperor, according to Seneca, was insulted to be called Gaius. He was clearly not an easy man to please. The attempt to meet a fairly wide readership presents a number of inevitable drawbacks. Some of the information that is provided will seem elementary and superficial to the specialist. The first two chapters, in particular, contain some very basic information meant to offer a summary of events, from the rise of Augustus to the accession of Caligula. This kind of background material is essential for the non-specialist, but unfortunately must summarize in brief paragraphs, without lengthy comment, issues that are highly complex and often very controversial, and may seem like a potted history of the period, at times with little direct reference to Caligula. For this, and for what might seem an almost plotine habit of repeatedly identifying my characters, who at times all seem to lay reader to have the same name, I plead the specialist's indulgence. The usual inconsistencies abound. Large, imprecise distances are expressed in miles, since that is what the idiom of the language dictates. But in accordance with modern practice, the metric system is used to define precise archaeological description. It is also one of the curiosities of our language that we speak of Mark Anthony and Marcus Agrippa use the modern terms for, say, Naples and Mainz but prefer the ancient ones of Bononia, Bologna, and Putioli, Pozuoli. So those two, Bononia, spelled B-O-N-O-N-I-A, representing the ancient name for the uh, modern, Bologna, B-O-L-O-G-N-A, and Putioli, P-U-T-E-O-L-I to the modern P-O-Z-Z-U-O-L-I and tend to flip back and forth between Lugdunum and Leons, Tiber and Tivoli. This book follows no rules beyond the author's own perception of current use. At the heart of any study of Caligula's reign is the problem of the literary sources. While the subject may not appeal to the general reader, it simply cannot be ignored, 
and a brief outline of the issues is essential. Moreover, many of the events of Caligula's reign were shaped over 50 years earlier, when Augustus's transformed the way Rome was governed, and at least an elementary acquaintance with the settlement he established is essential for an understanding of the Julio-Claudian period. The paragraphs that follow are the briefest possible introduction to the two subjects, and may safely be skipped by anyone claiming even a nodding acquaintance with Roman history and historiography. or historiography, if you prefer. Subtitle, The Literary Sources. There are two major surviving contemporary sources for the Caligulan period. Seneca the Younger, before AD 1 to 65, was a witness to the events of the reign and would have known Caligula personally. He was a philosopher, in the broadest sense, rather than historian, but often drew his exempla from the recent events that can potentially be a useful source of information. In fact, though he refers to Caligula frequently, he provides little of political significance, and his allusions to this particular emperor are generally of relatively little positive value, as he was clearly obsessed by personal and Tiffany. In fact, though he refers to Caligula frequently, he provides little of political significance, and his allusions to this particular emperor are generally of relatively little positive value, as he was clearly obsessed by personal antipathy. Seneca made a career from obsequious flattery of the living emperors and unfettered vilification of their dead predecessors. He would have good personal reasons for hostility towards Caligula, at both the personal and the political level. He was exiled because of his adultery with one of the emperor's sisters, an affair that may well have had political overtones. Moreover, Caligula ridiculed his literary style. Another contemporary was Philo, about 30 BC, 8 to AD 45, a native of Alexandria who led the Jewish delegation to Rome in 39 to 40. He was left, he has left us two works in Greek which refer to this period in the Flacum and a work of uncertain title, conventionally referred to as the Legatio. In both, he is preoccupied with Jewish problems and Roman history, enters only to the extent that it impinges on Jewish events. Philo is an apologetic writer whose aim is to show his people in the best possible light. He makes no attempt to conceal his hostility towards Caligula and the Alexandrian Greeks, who together share the blame for the troubles of the Jews. Another important, though later, Jewish source is Josephus, born 37 to 38. Pro-Roman, with his with little sympathy for the extremes of Jewish nationalism, but clearly in complete sympathy with Jewish religious sentiment. His Jewish War, the history of the Jewish uprising against Rome in 66 to 70, with an extensive introduction, was written originally in Aramaic, and Josephus provided an amplified Greek translation, which appeared 75 to 79. His Jewish Antiquities was apparently written from the outset in Greek, dealing with the history of the Jewish people down to the outbreak of the war. It appeared in 93 to 94. Josephus provides the most detailed account of any phase of Caligula's reign, the events surrounding his assassination, 
He wrote at some length on the event because it served an important moral purpose, bringing happiness to the world and saving the Jews from destruction. Unfortunately, for all his moral earnestness, Josephus' version is in places hopelessly confused and riddled with mistakes, some of them the result of his uncritical methods, but many apparently the consequence of his own creativity, since it seems to have been distorted to underscore the moral lesson that is sought, it's sought to teach. The corrupt state of the manuscripts further compounds the confusion. Bolsden described Josephus as, in historical judgment, the most worthless of our authorities. It is only fair to add that on more purely Jewish affairs, his account is much more valuable. The most important sources for the reign are, of course, Suetonius and Dial. Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus was born around 70 AD, possibly in North Africa. He held a number of appointments under Trajan and Hadrian. The Lives of the Caesars is his most famous work, one only of a wide range of topics, composed during a prolific career. Suetonius does not claim to write history, and there is no evidence of a broad grasp of major issues in his works. He shows a little interest in great public or political matters, unless they reflect on the behavior of the emperor. One great disadvantage for the modern historical researcher is that he did not adopt a chronological approach, and probably took it for granted that the basic outline of events would already be familiar to his reader. Although he is capable of serious historical research, making use of original sources such as letters or public records, he is often unreliable. His main failing is not apparently that he fabricates material, but rather that he has a tendency to believe, or at least to record, the worst and is unable to resist colorful anecdotes, especially if they reflect badly on his subject. He does not seem to have considered it part of his role to assess the validity of rumors, but merely to record them, and is too keen to accept absurd or scandalous accounts, even where his sources offer reasonable ones. The elder Seneca's account of Tiberius's death which seems unconvincing, is given in the life of Tiberius, along with others that are unconvincing, and is not even mentioned in the Caligula. In the life of Galba, events in Germany are presented as a brilliant feat of arms, while in the life of Caligula they are part of an absurd farce. Cassius Dio was a provincial aristocrat of Nicaea in Bithynia, the son of a consular who held the consulship himself in 222 and 229. His history, written in Greek, seems to have covered the period from the early kings down to Severus Alexander. It displays little interest in deep analysis, and is essentially a compilation of facts with little scope for theorizing or judgment. Where he expresses an opinion, it tends to be relevant only for the specific issue at hand, and he provides no coherent body of political ideas. He rarely cites his literary sources, and never does so in the Caligula chapters. Like Suetonius, he makes little effort to distinguish between hostile and favorable sources, between the plausible and the absurd. His account of Caligula takes up 
book 59 of his history. Unfortunately, there is a gap in the middle of the Quaternion of the MS from the end of book 59 to the beginning of book 60 is lost. For most of AD 40, we have to depend on the epitomes made by Joannes Zephilianus in the 11th century and Joannes Zonaras in the early 12th. The epitomators, especially Zephilinus, have a tendency to select rather than summarize, so that some of the important narrative is lost entirely, such as the incorporation of the provinces of Mauritania in AD 40, and mentioned only in the index. Dio's great value is that he is the only source to treat Caligula's reign in an analytic form, although his scheme is far from rigid. He will sometimes treat issues thematically out of chronological context. Thus Caligula's leanings towards self-deification are treated under the year 40, but include incidents that must belong to an earlier part of the reign. It might be expected that Dio, or Dio, as an analytic historian rather than biographer, would be less prone to gossip and distortion than was Suetonius. In fact, this is not so. By contrast with Suetonius, who lists a number of worthy achievements of Caligula, the princeps, as opposed to his excesses as monster, in quotes, Dio is drudging when it comes to giving the emperor any credit for his achievements, and even condemns some that Suetonius classifies as statesmanlike. In his general desire to exaggerate his cruelty, Dio seems to take liberties with the facts. Under 37, for instance, he says that Caligula punished those who had plotted against his mother and brothers. And then he places in 38 the convictions of the same people on the basis of documents assumed destroyed earlier. But under 39 we are told that in the year Caligula presented the evidence on the cases before the Senate and the persecutions began. Both Dio and Suetonius embellish and exaggerate. Suetonius tells us, for example, that when the cost of providing cattle to feed the wild beast became prohibitive, Caligula used criminals to feed them, without discriminating according to the charge. In its bare essentials, this is probably the true story. It reappears in a different form in Dio, who likes to emphasize the theme of indiscriminate cruelty. He claims that when there was a shortage of criminals to be given to the wild beasts, Caligula ordered that the unfortunate spectators standing near the benches be seized and be thrown to them. To make sure that there would be no complaint, he ordered that their tongues be cut out. The story is recycled in yet another form by Suetonius, who was particularly sensitive to mistreatment of equestrians. He asserts that when a Roman knight was about to be thrown to the beast he protected, and so had his tongue cut out before he was sent to the arena. Underlying these stories is the brutal but traditional Roman penalty of damnatio ad bestias, for which there were precedents going as far back as Scipio Africanus, who, after his victory over Carthage, threw deserters and runaway slaves to the beasts. The practice was continued until at least Constantine, who disposed of his German prisoners in this way. Caligula probably behaved no better or worse than his successors. Caligula's Sorry, Claudius made use of this 
form of punishment, as did Nero, in the famous persecution of the Christians after the fire of Rome. The story thus indicates how unreliable in their details such anecdotes are, and also how the events distorted in them have to be seen within the framework of Roman traditions. Second subtitle, The Augustan Settlement. The second topic requiring some preliminary consideration is the Augustan Settlement. The Battle of Actium in 31 BC left Octavian, later Augustus, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, in effective control of the political and military affairs of Rome. For ambitious Romans, the traditional career structure of the Old Republic still, however, existed, even if it no longer led to the exercise of real political power. The chief legislative and deliberative body continued to be the Senate, which in this period consisted essentially of some 600 former magistrates of the rank of quaestor or higher. A man could become quaestor in his 25th year. Twenty were elected annually, concerned generally with financial matters. The quaestorship could be followed by one of two offices. That of edile, concerned with certain aspects of municipal administration, or tribune appointed originally to protect the interest of the plebeians, but in the imperial period concerned mainly with minor judicial matters. The quaestorship would often, however, be followed directly by the next office in the strict hierarchy, and the first of major importance, the praetorship, twelve elected annually at least five years after the quaestorship which brought responsibility for the administration of justice and also for the organization of the public games. Eventually, at the legal age of 43, a man could enter one of the two consulships. In many of the consuls, old functions had been taken over by imperial officials, but the post remained prestigious and no more than half who embarked on a senatorial career could hope to attain it. For those connected to the imperial family, however, the prospects were excellent and often accelerated. Consuls and praetors exercised a special power, imperium, and after their term of office they could often be granted a province, which by the Augustan age generally meant a specific territory organized as an administrative unit. In their provinces, they continued to exercise their imperium in the capacity of their earlier offices, that is, proconsul or propraetore. In early 27 BC, Octavian gave up the powers he had assumed, and he placed his provinces at the disposal of the Senate to dispense, theoretically, as they thought fit. They in turn granted him an enormous province, embracing as its core a Gaul, Syria, and a most of Spain, known for convenience as the imperial provinces, for a period of ten years with provision for renewal. It was in these areas that, with some exceptions, the Roman legions were stationed, and since Augustus, as he was known from then on, personally appointed the commanders legati, he was in effect the commander-in-chief of the Roman army. The privilege of the triumph, the great military parade through Rome that followed a victory of a commander in the field gradually became the prerogative of the emperor and his family. 
In very general terms, although the division was not rigid, the Senate looked to the administration of the remaining senatorial provinces, strategically of less significance, and governed by ex praetors and ex consuls, chosen by lot. Egypt had a special status, ruled as a sort of private imperial domain by Augustus in his capacity as successor of the Ptolemies. Augustus held a consulship continually from 31 BC on. This, as he recognized, blocked the career prospects of ambitious contemporaries and also reduced the number of potential administrators of consular rank. According, accordingly, he resigned the office after 23 BC to hold it again on only two occasions. Moreover, from 5 BC, it became routine for the consuls to resign at least halfway through the year to make way for replacements. Suffix. Thus further increasing the supply of men of proconsular rank. In compensation for giving up the consulship in 23 BC, Augustus was granted proconsular imperium maius for life which being Maius, spelt M-A-I-U-S, greater, in brackets, prevailed in the senatorial as well as in the imperial provinces. Moreover, it was valid not only in the provinces, but within the city of Rome also. In the same year, he assumed the traditional authority of the tribunes, the tribunicia protestas, potestas, this gave him a certain legal, again, that would be Tribunicia Potestas, spelt T-R-I-B-U-N-I-C-I-A, P-O-T-E-S-T-A-S. This gave him certain legal rights to convene the Senate and assemblies of the people to initiate legislation and to exercise a veto. Even more importantly, it conferred on him Sacron Sanctitas, spelt S-A-C-R-O-S-A-N-C-T-I-T-A-S, a significant element in the evolving notion of the princeps as one meriting exceptional awe and reverence. While the Roman noble families, previously the dominant force in Roman political life, might resent the changes wrought by Augustus and look back with nostalgia at the old republic, for many Romans the imperial period was the opening of opportunities. This applied in particular to the equestrian class. They occupied the second rank of the Roman social and economic hierarchy and not the nobility, which required a higher curial magistry. If not a consulship in one's family background, and constituted essentially the financial and mercantile class. Again, they occupied the second rank of the Roman social and economic hierarchy, and not the nobility, which required a higher Curial magistracy, if not a consulship in one's family background, and constituted essentially the financial and mercantile class. They had, with minor exceptions, been largely barred from service to the state and were now given new opportunities for administrative duties. At the apex of their career stood the four major prefecturies of Egypt. The Praetorian Guard, the Anona, corn supply, or the Vigils, city police. The structure was, with some modifications, still in force 
in the Caligulan period, when the careful balances put in place under Augustus were to be subjected to their severest test. History records that despite Caligula's best efforts, the system would long survive him. The most pleasant task in a project of this type is to record the generous assistance of friends and colleagues, like many others. I find myself particularly indebted to Graham Webster, who was provided steadfast who has provided steadfast help and guidance from the outset. Henry Hurst has kept me regularly informed on his excavations in the Roman Forum, and kindly shared his tentative thoughts prior to the final overall interpretation of the site. A number of scholars have offered guidance on specific issues, either in correspondence or in discussions, and I thank, in particular, John Casey, Paul Gallivan, Roger Ling, Peter Wiseman, Brooke Levy, and Ian Carides. Duncan Fishwick has been extremely helpful on a number of points in the text, particularly the problems of emperor worship. My colleagues in Vancouver, James Russell and Hector Williams, have kept me informed of recent archaeological thinking, and I have also much benefited from the lively comments of our graduate students, especially Sandra Duane, Lindsay Martin, and Kathy Shearwood. On the technical side, I am grateful to Margaret Milne for drawing the maps, and to Ogle Betts for help with the more complicated aspects of moving the material about on computers. My family has been a constant source of support and encouragement. Doreen and Jackie read the proofs and offered a very frank criticism. Sarah, in addition, helped me in the preparation of the index. As the manuscript moved slowly to its closing stage, Peter Kemis, Betty, sorry, again, as the manuscript moved slowly to its closing stage, Peter Kemis, Betty, displayed an admirable combination of patience, amiability, and persistence in getting it to press. Much of the research for Caligula was undertaken during the tenure of a visiting fellowship at Clare Hall in the University of Cambridge, and my task was considerably lightened by the intellectual stimulation and warm collegiality that I experienced there. Before we move on to chapter one, um, I've decided to add uh, Barrett's outline of significant events. Highly speculated dates are indicated by italics. The chronology of events in Judea in 39 and 40 is particularly uncertain. Okay, as I read through these, um, I am not going to mention um, which events are speculate or highly speculative. Um, I'll leave that up to the independent scholars out there. Okay, so beginning in AD 12, August 31st, birth of Caligula. 14 AD, May 18, Caligula sent to Gaul, Germany, by Augustus. August 19th, death of Augustus. 17 AD, May 26, Caligula attends Germanicus's triumph in Rome. After summer, Caligula accompanies parents on Eastern mission. 18 AD. Early in the year, Caligula 
delivers speech in ASOS. AD 19. October 10th. Death of Germanicus. AD 20. Early in year. Caligula returns to Italy with mother. AD 27. Late in year. Caligula moves to Olivia's house on the Palatine. AD 29. Before June, Livia dies. Caligula moves to house of Antonia. AD 31. Before October, a death of Nero, who was the Nero that was, you know, Caligula's brother, not the Nero that would succeed after Cl Claudius. After August 31st, Caligula summoned to Capri. October 18th, Sejanus falls. AD 32, Flaccus appointed prefect of Egypt. AD 33, Caligula made quaestor. Caligula marries Junia Claudia. Deaths of mother and Drusus, brother. AD 35, Tiberius names Caligula joint heir with Gemellus. AD 36, arrival of Herod Agrippa in Capri. AD 37, early in year, Vitellius reaches a settlement with the Parthians. March 16th, death of Tiberius. March 18th, Caligula hailed as imperator by Senate. March 28th, Caligula enters Rome. March 28th or 29th, Caligula granted powers by Senate. April, Caligula recovers remains of mother and Nero. April 21, former confirmation of Caligula's powers. May 1st, death of Antonia. July 1st, Caligula enters first consulship for two months. August 30th, 31st, dedication of a temple of Augustus. September 21st, title of Pater Patriae granted by a Senate. After September 21st, Caligula fails, falls ill. Late October, Caligula recovers. A near end of year, dedication of Temple of Augustus, Caligula marries Livia slash Cornelia. 38 AD, in course of year, abolition of sales tax, Restoration of elections to people. Early in year. A death of Macro and wife. June 10th. Death of Drusilla. August. Arrival of Herod Agrippa in Alexandria. Disturbances in Alexandria. September 23rd. Consecration of Drusilla. Shortly after, Caligula marries Lalia Paulina. October. Flaccus arrested and banished. October 21st, fire in the Aemilian district. 39 AD. January 1st, Caligula enters second consulship, 30 days. Early in year, Caligula denounces the Senate, restoration of Maestas a charge. Spring, marriage to Sisonia. One month later, birth of Drusilla, daughter. Summer, bridge at Baiae, imperial control of Legio to Africa. After September 3rd, consuls removed from office. 
before October 27, prosecution of Sabinus, governor of Pannonia, execution of Lepidus, departure of Caligula for Mavania. Gaetulicus and Lepidus exposed and probably executed. Galba appointed to Upper Germany. Agrippina and Livilla, sisters, banished. Caligula departs for the north. After October 27th, further, Maesta's trials in Rome. Caligula meets first senatorial deputation in Lyons. Winter of 39-40. Alexandrian envoys leave for Rome. Disturbances at Jamnia. 40 A.D. January 1st. Caligula enters third consulship. Twelve days. Early in the year. Caligula joins Rhine armies. Caligula receives surrender of Adminius at Channel. Early in the year. Ptolemy summoned to Rome. Spring. Petronius ordered to place a statue in temple at Jerusalem. May. Caligula receives second senatorial delegation. Caligula in vicinity of Rome. First meeting with Alexandrian deputation. Summer. Caligula in Campania. Summer. Meeting with Herod Antipas. Return of Herod Agrippa to Rome. Ptolemy executed in Rome. Rebellion in Mauritania. August 31st. Entry into Rome and ovation. After August 31st, second meeting with Alexandrian deputation, imposition of new taxes in Rome. Late in year, execution of suspected conspirators. 41 AD, January 1st, Caligula enters fourth consulship. Six days. Late January, assassination during Ludi. Palatini. Fifty four AD, October thirteen. Death of Claudius. June ninth. The death of Nero. That's in sixty eight AD. Odd thing that in uh, just a personal footnote where it says 41 AD, January 1st, Caligula enters fourth consulship, and this only lasts six days. But still, it follows up here. It says late January. Late January, assassination during Ludi Palatini. Well, how, how do you figure? January 1st, Caligula enters fourth consulship, right? That's the 1st of January. Six days after that, what's that? The 7th? The 6th or the 7th? It's one of the two. That's not late January. That's not even, that's the first week of January. Huh? What? Mm, perhaps I'm missing something there, but I, I don't think so. Something's going on there. But anyway, those are... Yeah, outside of that, I, I have nothing else to say about that. But the outline of significant events. And um, we've already been through the foreword, which leads us to chapter one, which is entitled Family Background. When the future emperor, Gaius Caligula, was born in AD 12, he came into a Roman world that had been dominated by a single individual for some 40 years. The Battle of Actium in 31 BC and the defeat of the combined forces of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra brought an end to almost a century of unrest and political violence. The victor, Octavian Gaius Julius Caesar, Octavianus, adopted son of the murdered Julius Caesar, 
emerged from it as the most powerful figure in the state. In 27 BC, he began the process by which the traditional form of the Roman Republic could be theoretically restored, while he, in practical terms, remained firmly in power. Thus he resigned the extraordinary powers he had accumulated, receiving certain others in return, nominally bestowed by the Senate and the Roman people. Augustus, as he henceforth was known, sought to present his role as the princeps first citizen, one magistrate among many others with greater powers than they, but not inherently superior or different. By holding significant offices concurrently, however, with extensions of the powers that he held, he effectively controlled political and military life in Rome and the provinces. The last century of the Republic had seen a succession of powerful military commanders who exploited the loyalty of their troops to further their own political ambitions. The impossibility of a return to the old Republic had been symbolized by the constitutional appointment in 43 BC of the Second Triumvirate which handed over effective control of the state to a partnership of three powerful military figures, Marcus Lepidus, Mark Anthony, and Octavian. The eventual emergence of a form of monarchy, no matter how well disguised to avoid offending Roman sensibilities, was the inevitable next stage. The change was not necessary. This change was not necessarily for the worse, since, as compensation for the loss of real political independence, Augustus was able to offer Rome a period of peace and relative stability. For when he came to power, Caligula fell heir to the political and military order first established by Augustus and nurtured by his successor. Tiberius. Caligula also enjoyed the more personal advantage of a distinguished family background. He was the first of the Roman emperors who could claim a link by bloodline rather than simply by marriage or adoption, with both of the two great families, the Julian and the Claudian, that have given their name to Rome's first dynasty. Through his mother, Agrippina, figure two, he could trace a direct link to Augustus. In the 20, in 21 BC, that emperor approved the marriage between his only child, his daughter Julia, and his old comrade in arms, Agrippa, 64-3, to 12 BC. Although of obscure family origins, Agrippa had proved himself a man of considerable talent and energy and a loyal supporter of Octavian Augustus after the murder of Julius Caesar in 44 BC. He was largely responsible for the defeat of Anthony at Actium and had followed this with a number of important military and diplomatic missions playing a key role also in the great building program in the city of Rome. Julia, at the time of their marriage, was only 18, but already a widow, having previously been married to her cousin Marcellus. This second marriage seems on the whole to have proved successful, and she bore Agrippa five children, including Caligula's mother. It was only later in life that Julia became a show, a streak of willful independence, combined with a sharp and cutting tongue, that both her daughter, Agrippina, and her grandson, Caligula, appear to have inherited. Caligula's family history on his father's side was also impressive. His paternal grandfather, Nero Claudius Drusus, came from an ancient and distinguished Roman family, through both Drusus's father and his mother, Tiberius Claudius Nero, and the not 
victorious Olivia. Both parents belonged to branches of the Claudian family. Livia's name derived from an adoption. Tiberius Claudius Nero, the father, was for a time an opponent of Octavian, and was obliged eventually to leave Italy, but made use of a general amnesty to return in 39 BC with his wife Livia and their infant son, the future emperor Tiberius, born 42 BC. The return was to prove dramatically significant for later history. Octavian became infatuated with Livia and pressured her husband to divorce her, even though she was pregnant. Octavian, likewise, divorced his own similarly pregnant wife, Scribonia. On the 17th of January, 38 BC, only three days after the birth of her second son, Drusus, Nero Claudius Drusus, the grandfather of Caligula, Livia married Octavian. Her former husband died in relative obscurity in 33 BC, giving over his two sons, Drusus and Tiberius, to the tutorship of Octavian, who took appropriate steps to introduce them to public life, allowing them to enter office before the legal minimum age. Drusus strengthened his bond with Augustus, when, in about 16 BC, he married Antonia, the daughter of Mark Anthony, and Augustus's sister, Octavia. Antonia was a strong-willed and independent woman, widely respected and admired. She bore her husband three children, the promising and, and highly popular Germanicus, Caligula's father, born 16 or 15 BC, Claudius, born 10 BC, who was lame and sickly, but had common sense and a sharp mind, and would himself go on to become emperor, and a daughter, Lavilla, a born 13 BC, destined to become the mistress of the notorious Sejanus. Through Antonia, Caligula could thus trace a second, less direct link with Augustus, and was the first emperor descended from Augustus's arch-enemy, Mark Anthony. When Caligula came to power, he saw as one of his priorities the military defeat of the rebellious Germans along the Rhine frontier. He had, in a sense, inherited this task from his grandfather, Drusus, who in a series of brilliant campaigns between 12 and 9 carried Roman arms as far as the Elbe. His death in 11, from a riding accident, plunged Rome into deepest mourning. Drusus's tremendous popularity had been enhanced by his personal affability and charm, as well as the widely held belief that he was determined to push for the return of the old Republican system. He was honored by the posthumous title of Germanicus, which passed also to his descendants. More importantly, he was also to bequeath to his descendants, including Caligula, the belief that the northern frontier was for their family the field of honor, where their place in military history was to be established. After Drusus's death, other commanders continued operations in Germany, which came to an abrupt and disastrous end when the Roman army suffered one of the greatest military defeats of their, her history. In AD 9, three legions were massacred in the Tudorburg forest, and their commander Varus committed suicide. The Roman dream of expansion beyond the Rhine had now to be abandoned. Tiberius rushed to the area to organize the Rhine defenses and to forestall any invasion of Gaul. Eight legions in all were deployed to defend the frontier equally divided between the two command districts of Lower and Upper Germany, and not strictly speaking provinces, but under the overall jurisdiction of the governor of the three Gauls. Tiberius did his work with great vigor. He returned to Rome in AD 11, and his place in Germany was taken by Drusus' son Germanicus whose charm far exceeded his talents, and whose popularity would outstrip even his father's. Germanicus, father of Caligula, was born May 24th, 
16 or 15 BC. Despite his later fame, virtually nothing is known of his early life before his adoption by Tiberius in 84. This adoption represents one of the several attempts by Augustus to deal with perhaps the most intractable difficulty of his principate, the succession question, and to this we must briefly turn, since it is an issue that must be understood, at least in outline, as a background to the events that would lead eventually to Caligula's accession. accession. The problem was made especially complex by the fact that Augustus's real position in the Roman state was a personal one, and there was no theoretical mechanism by which authority could be handed on to a successor. When in the years immediately following the Battle of Actium, special powers were conferred on him, he went to great pains to emphasize that they had been granted by the Senate, and in theory for a limited period of time. On his death, the Senate could again, in theory, act as it thought fit, and bestow the appropriate powers on the most qualified successor. The reality was, of course, quite different. Augustus had based his claim to power on the principle that he was Caesar's son, and the basic drive of human nature would have impelled him to keep the succession in his own line and within the Julian family. It could even be argued that he had almost a responsibility to ensure that one of his own line would succeed to prevent the clash of rival factions and the renewal of the chaos of the civil wars. His strategy was to associate his designated choice with him as partner in the chief powers of the Principate, the Proconsular Imperium and Tribunician power. In this, in this way, he could place all of his prestige and position behind his own candidate, while in theory leaving the actual decision on whether to confirm and renew these powers to the Senate. By 21 BC, he had found a solution to the twin demands of responsibility to orderly government and of instinctive familial ambitions. Agrippa divorced his own wife to marry the emperor's daughter, Julia, presumably with the idea that while he might control affairs in the events of Augustus's death, power would at least eventually pass to one of emperor's line. The birth of the two sons, Gaius, 20, and Lucius, 17, boded well for the plan. The and Augustus confirmed their place in the succession by adopting both in 17. By the time of his death in 12 BC, Agrippa had fathered, in addition to Gaius and Lucius, daughters Julia, born about 19, and Agrippina, the mother of Caligula, born about 14, and a third son, Agrippa Posthumus, born, as his name indicates, after his father's death, and whose wild behavior would apparently rule him out as a factor in the Augustan plans, in part to provide a proper upbringing for Gaius and Lucius. Augustus sought another husband for his daughter. His stepson Tiberius was called upon to fill the role and accordingly divorced his wife, Agrippa's daughter, Vipsania, whom he had married in twenty to nineteen B.C. He seemed to have been genuinely fond of Vespania. Sorry. <sighs> he seems to have been genuinely fond of Vipsania, and would come to regret bitterly his marriage in eleven to the headstrong Julia. Tiberius had enjoyed a successful military career on the northern frontiers. He held the consulship first in 13 BC, and in 8 assumed the office for a second time. And two years later, a clear sign of Augustus's favor was granted Tribunicia Potestas, and an important mission 
to the east with proconsular imperium Maeus. But his success was overshadowed by the popular attention now being paid to the emperor's grandson and adopted son, the young Gaius Caesar. Tiberius was by nature sober and austere in his true element on campaign with his soldiers, and uncomfortable amidst the intrigue and politics of Rome. He felt, correctly, that Augustus had a little affection for him, and that, at best, he would be the successor of last resort. He also knew that Gaius enjoyed a popularity that he could not hope to match. For his own peace of mind, he decided that his best course was to remove himself from the political arena, and he persuaded a reluctant Augustus to allow him to retire to Rhodes. As it turned out, he found his life there to be very much that of an exile, and he was obliged to humble himself by making repeated requests to be allowed to return permission, was finally granted in 2 AD. Permission was finally granted in 2 AD, shortly before Augustus suffered a major blow when Lucius Caesar died on his way to Spain. Yet another serious setback to his dynastic plans befell him less than two years later, when Gaius died from a wound suffered while on a mission to the east. At long last, Tiberius was given formal and unequivocal recognition as Augustus's successor. On June 26, AD 4, at the age of 45, he was finally adopted with Agrippa Posthumus as Augustus's son and granted Tribunicia Potestas, probably for a term of 10 years, as well as a command in Germany. But any pleasure that Tiberius might have felt over this development would have been tinged with humiliation since he was in turn obliged to adopt his nephew, Germanicus, even though he had a natural son, Drusus, probably only two years younger. It is noteworthy that Agrippa Posthumus played no part in Augustus's dynastic schemes. He received the toga virilis, the token of manhood, in AD 5, but by the following year, it seemed, it seems, has started to fall into disgrace. His ties with his family were severed, and he was eventually sent into permanent exile on the island of Planasia near Corsica. The official reason was his ferocia, beastly nature, and it is possible that he suffered from some form of mental derangement. The attitude of the ancient sources towards Germanicus is one of a blatant partnership. Suetonius, who devotes to him a large section of the life of Caligula, claims that he surpassed his contemporaries both in physical and moral qualities, and was a gifted man of letters into the bargain. But despite his supposed achievements, he remained modest and considerate, and was immensely popular partly because it was felt that he had inherited his father's republican leanings. Tacitus reports the belief that if Germanicus had ruled the world, he surely would have outdone Alexander the Great in military achievements, just as he surpassed him in personal qualities. These impressions clearly represent a romanticized view of Caligula's father, one that was no doubt fostered among the Roman people by anti-Tiberian elements after his early death. Although a closer inspection of his career reveals serious errors in judgment and even a degree of emotional instability, the reality would prove far less important than the image in fostering the prospects of his son for the Principate. As a clear indication of Augustus's determination to be succeeded by someone from his own line, Germanicus shortly after his adoption by Tiberius was married to the emperor's granddaughter, Agrippina. Germanicus 
Germanicus's new wife possessed the streak of powerful independence that seemed to run through many of the women of the imperial family. Her mother, Julia, would be controlled neither by her father nor by Tiberius, and her behavior was eventually to lead to her banishment to the island of Pendateria. Agrippina's sister, the younger Julia, who matched her mother's reputation for waywardness, was also condemned to permanent banishment from Rome. Agrippina deferred from her mother and sister in that her private life appears to have been beyond reproach. But she showed the same determination to control events rather than to be controlled, the same reluctance to yield to forces far more powerful than herself. Tacitus is well disposed towards her, yet even his sympathetic portrait is marked by phrases like excitable, arrogant, proud, fierce, obstinate, ambitious. His observations are reinforced by other sources. Suetonius records that her grandfather Augustus, who had fixed views on moderation and propriety in speech, cautioned his granddaughter not to speak moleste offensively. In brackets. This streak of ruthless arrogance contributed very largely to her eventual destruction. Agrippina was aware that, the, that in Imperial Rome a woman could not exercise power in her own right, but she could see in Livia a precedent for the central role that the wife of the emperor could play. While it would be wrong to deny her the normal familial affections, it is hard not to believe that behind her almost fanatical devotion to her family there looked, there looked definite political ambitions. She was to bear Germanicus nine children, six of whom survived infancy. Apart from Caligula, there were two other older sons, Nero, born about eighty six, and to be destined distinguished from the notorious emperor, Drusus, about seven, eight, and three daughters, Agrippina Minor, fifteen, Drusilla, sixteen, and Livilla, seventeen or eighteen. The children thus included not only a future emperor, but also, in Agrippina Minor, the mother of yet another Nero. Germanicus's first achieved distinction, serving under Tiberius during the Pannonian Revolt, where he showed courage and military skill. In AD 11, he went to Germany to join Tiberius once again. No important successes were recorded in this year, no doubt reflecting Tiberius's cautious policy of consolidating a defensive position rather than engaging in reckless military adventures. And Germanicus returned to Rome no later than the autumn of 11, celebrating his first consulship in the following year. We know little of his term of office, except that he slaughtered 200 lions during the Ludi Martiales. It was thus during his father's consular year, AD 12, that Gaius Caligula was born. The date of August 31st is fixed precisely by both Suetonius and the Fasta. There is less certainty about the place of birth, and Suetonius's discussion of the question is one of the most detailed of its kind in any ancient historian. Suetonius admits that there is conflicting testimony on the question, and lists the suggestions. Ga Tulicus, military commander in Upper Germany in Caligula's reign and poet, and destined to be executed by Caligula as a conspirator, wrote that the birthplace was Tiber, Tivoli. Pliny the Elder placed it in Germany, at Ambitarvium, among the Trevera, while an anonymous epigram that circulated when Caligula was emperor claimed, a baby in the camp, a son in the line. He was sure to be next emperor, 
it's a very clear sign. Castri natus, patris nutritus, in armies, em designati principis omen erat. Suetonius is not impressed. He dismisses Gaetulicus as a flattering liar, then goes on to refute Pliny's evidence. An inscription seen at M. Bitarvium, referring to Agrippina's delivery, and taken by Pliny to refer to Caligula's birth, could refer to the birth of one of Agrippina's daughters. Unspecified historians of Augustus, Suetonius says, were in agreement that Germanicus did not return to Germany until the close of his consulship, when Caligula was already born. Suetonius provides his own candidate, Antium, and claims that he saw the birth there recorded in Actis, presumably the Actu Diurna, or record of important public events. Antium, Anzio, had long been a favorite resort of the wealthy Romans, and was much favored by the Julio Claudians. Augustus enjoyed living there, and it was the birthplace of the Emperor Nero, and of his daughter Claudia Augusta. Suetonius's further argument that Caligula preferred Antium before all other places, and planned to move the seat of empire there, is hardly conclusive, and somewhat anti climatic. In any case, the latter story was told also of Alexandria. One may wonder why, if the evidence for Antium was so explicit, Suetonius should have been so defensive, and his purpose may have been to show up other historians with a display of his scholarship. It is worth noting that Tacitus, not mentioned by Suetonius, perhaps intentionally, accepts that Caligula was born in the legionary camp, in Castri Genetus. By at least the end of 12, Germanicus returned to the north as governor of the three Gauls, which would have given him overall authority over the eight legions posted on the Rhine. Caligula seems to have stayed in Rome with his great-grandfather Augustus in the imperial residence on the Palatine. On the 18th May, um, sorry, that, the, this date, it's, it reads this way. On 18 May 14, when not quite two, he was sent to join his mother in an unspecified location. Germanicus was at this time engaged in carrying out a census among the Gauls, and because of her pregnancy, Agrippina had perhaps remained in Cologne, Epidum Ubiorum. It is only by assuming that she and her husband were in different locations that we can make sense of the latter that Augustus wrote to her on that occasion part of which is quoted by Suetonius. In it, the emperor expresses his worry about his great-grandson's health and reports that he is sending him in the company of a physician, whom they are welcome to keep. He also expresses the hope that Agrippina will reach her husband in good health. His concern may allude specifically to her pregnancy. On joining his mother in Germany, Caligula seems to have become the favorite of the troops, displaying a precocious sense of self-importance, dressed up like a little soldier in a little soldier's uniform, and earning the nickname of Caligula Little Boots, from the Caliga, or hobnailed boots, worn by soldiers of the rank of centurion. Down. In a later life, according to Seneca, he was to find the name distasteful. The idea for his costume could well have been his mother's. Certainly, one of the rumors, later fed by the sinister Praetorian prefect, 
Sejanus to Tiberius was that Agrippina was responsible for parading him in an ordinary soldier's garb, and that she had asked that he be called Caesar Caligula. Hardened soldiers throughout history have always been prone to sentimentality, and this game did seem to create a strong bond between them and the infant Caligula, and may perhaps explain in part why the legend grew that he was born on campaign. On 19th of August, A.D. 14, Augustus died to be succeeded by his adopted son, and the 55 year old Tiberius. There was no precedent to show how the succession should be effected, and in a sense none was needed. In his will Augustus named Tiberius heir to most of his estate, and bequeathed to him the title of Augustus. But of more constitutional significance, in the previous year the emperor had granted him proconsular imperium equal to his own as well as a renewal of his tribune okay we got a word here folks tribunician power spelled t r i b u n i c i a n tribunician root word tribune power <laughs> By virtue of these powers, Tiberius was able to handle immediate administrative problems, and his position was strengthened when the consuls swore an oath of loyalty, and administered the same oath to the Senate, knights, and people. Tiberius behaved from the outset as if he were emperor, giving the watchword to the Praetorian Guard in his capacity as imperator and dispatching letters to the armies. In Rome, at least, the Augustan scheme had worked well. For the modern historian, the situation is complicated by the Senate's role in Tiberius's elevation. He was rigidly conservative in his adherence to constitution niceties, and would have been greatly concerned to ensure that the ancient body play its proper legal part in confirming the accession. Unfortunately, neither the procedure nor even the precise chronology of events comes through clearly in the sources. There was a key meeting of the Senate on September 17th, shortly after the funeral. Augustus was declared a god, and exceptional honors voted for Olivia. Then the Senate entreated Tiberius, though whether to accept or continue the Principate is not made clear. There is no specific report of the substance of their motion. Tiberius, for his part, expressed great reluctance, pointing out that the burden of rule was too great for a single person. The purpose of these proceedings has been much discussed. It has been argued that Tiberius was seeking the moral authority of the Senate, or that he relinquished his powers to have them reconfirmed by that body, or that the Senate, all these guesses, confirmed not Augustus's powers, which Tiberius already had, but his provincia, or that he asked the Senate to devalue the enormous Provincia that had befallen him. Whatever the true sequence of events, Tiberius in the end yielded. As will be made clear, his successor Caligula would assume the Principate under quite different circumstances. Outside of Rome, Augustus's death had an unsettling effect on the northern legions where harsh conditions of service and unfulfilled commitments had already created a series of problems of morale. Drusus, the son of the new emperor, was dispatched to Pannonia, where violent riots had flared up among the troops, and by a shrewd combination of diplomatic tact and firmness, aided by a timely lunar eclipse, suppressed an incipient mutiny. The troubles on the Rhine were 
consecrated in Lower Germany and resulted basically from the same grievances as in Pannonia. But they are given a political color in the ancient sources, who all assert that the soldiers wanted Germanicus to seize supreme power, a claim of affection that is not easy to reconcile with his subsequent difficulties in securing their obedience. On hearing in Gaul of Augustus's death, Germanicus administered the oath of allegiance to the Sequani and Belgae, then hastened to the legions of Lower Germany, where riots had broken out and discipline had collapsed, with centurions being attacked and murdered. The officers seemed afraid to assert their authority, but his history does record that a youthful uh, Cassius Caria cut his way through a mob of mutineers. He would return to the historical stage some years later as tribune in the Praetorian Guard to play a pivotal role in the murder of Caligula. When he reached the camp, Germanicus tried to appeal to the men's loyalty, promising to see that their grievances would be dealt with. His efforts failed, and making a histrionic threat to commit suicide, he was jokingly encouraged to see it through. In the end, he was reduced to producing a forged letter of Tiberius, supposedly offering concessions, and to dipping into the money that he carried with him for official expenses, which seems for the moment to have worked. The arrangement was thrown into some jeopardy by the arrival of an embassy of the Senate, as the soldiers mistakenly believed that they had come to invalidate Germanicus's agreements. Both Germanicus and the senators were subjected to various indignities, and even Germanicus's own officers criticized him for his weakness in dealing with the mutineers. The precise sequence of events that followed is unclear. At this stage, Agrippina, along with Caligula, was with her husband in Cologne. By the time of the mutinies, she was pregnant again. She seems to have lost the child. And for her and Caligula's safety, Germanicus arranged for them to leave to seek protection among the Treveri. As the procession moved out of the camp, Agrippini, Agrippina clasped her son to her, comforted by the tearful wives of Germanicus's officials. According to Dio, the soldiers of Allegiant I and twenty seized Agrippina and the child. When they realized that she was pregnant, they let her go, but kept Caligula. Finally, they saw that they would achieve little by holding the infant hostage and released him also. Suetonius reflects his version of events in the reports that during his German campaign of 3940, Caligula, now emperor, planned to punish the troops because they had seized him during the revolt. Another version reported that by Tacitus, and followed by Suetonius in a different context, was that the soldiers were moved to remorse and shame at the commander's wife, granddaughter of Augustus, and a lady of outstanding chastity, should, along with her little son, the child of the legions, be forced to seek the protection of the despised Treveri. The pitiful sight, it is claimed, was enough in itself to persuade them to lay down their weapons. It is possible that the first, rather sordid, account is the true one, and that the second represents a pro-Germanicus version, perhaps circulated by Agrippina. Whatever the truth, the soldiers do seem to have relented, and this at least produced decisive action from Germanicus, although he went to great lengths to avoid any ill feelings towards himself, and left it to the soldiers to deal with the ringleaders, which they did with striking severity.
Germanicus greatly appreciated that the best, the best way of stifling any remaining thoughts of mutiny lay in action, and that same autumn launched a raid into the territory of the Marsi over the Rhine from Fatira, and defeated them prudently, withdrawing, however, when the neighboring tribes came to their assistance. It was probably Tiberius's hope that Germanicus would limit himself to the single action arranging in early 15, that a triumph be granted for his success, a, a gesture clearly out of proportion to the modest military success gained. But Germanicus clearly had visions of emulating his father, and of pushing the Roman frontier east of the Elbe, and pursued a more vigorous and far-reaching campaign in 15. The season started off well. The Romans advanced northeast, eventually reaching the Teutoburg Forest. Moving ceremonies were held in honor of the legionaries, who had died under Varus, and a funeral mound was raised. The troops now set off in pursuit of the Germans under Arminius, the leader, who had inflicted the great defeat on them in 89. But Germanicus made the mistake of penetrating too deeply into their territory, and almost fell into the same traps as had Varus. He extricated himself with difficulty. In full retreat, the exhausted Romans poured over the Rhine bridge at Vetera, where they were met by Agrippina, who shouted words of encouragement as they crossed over, distributing clothing and bandages to those who needed them. They discovered later that her contribution had been more than merely a boost to morale. When the bad news from Germany had filtered through, no doubt in exaggerated form, there had been some who had feared that the way was open for a German invasion and had wanted to destroy the bridge. It had been saved only by Agrippina's personal intervention. Whatever the truth, the soldiers do seem to have relented, and this at last produced decisive action from Germanicus, although he went to great lengths to avoid an ill feeling towards himself, and left it to the soldiers to deal with the ringleaders, which they did with striking severity. Germanicus rightly appreciated that the best way of stifling any remaining thoughts of mutiny lay in action, and that same autumn launched a raid into the territory of the Marsi over the Rhine from Vetera, and defeated them prudently, withdrawing, however, when neighboring tribes came to their assistance. It was probably Tiberius's hope that Germanicus would limit himself to the single action, arranging in early 15 that a triumph be granted for his success, a gesture clearly out of proportion to the modest military successes gained. But Germanicus clearly had visions of emulating his father, and of pushing the Roman frontier east to the Elbe, and pursued a more vigorous and far-reaching campaign in 15. The season started off well. The Romans advanced northeast, eventually reaching the Teutoburg Forest. Moving ceremonies were held in honor of the legionaries, who had died under Varus, and the funeral mound was raised. The troops and now set off in pursuit of the Germans under Arminius, the leader, who had inflicted the great defeat on them in 89. But Germanicus made the mistake of penetrating too deeply into their territory, and almost fell into the same trap as had Varus. He extricated himself with difficulty in full retreat. The exhausted Romans poured over the Rhine bridge at Vetera, where they were met by Agrippina, who shouted words of encouragement as they crossed over.
distributing clothing and bandages to those who needed them. They discovered, later, that her contribution had been more than merely a boost to morale. When the bad news from Germany had filtered through, no doubt in exaggerated form, there had been some who had feared that the way was open for a German invasion, and had wanted to destroy the bridge. It had been saved only by Agrippina's personal intervention. Further campaigns were conducted in AD 16. Germanicus transported his eight legions down the Wesser, and inflicted two major defeats on the enemy. But Arminius remained free, and on the return voyage a disaster struck the Romans, where the fleet was hit by a storm. The survivors were cast along the shoreline of a North Sea, some as far afield as Britain. Fresh incursions were made into Germany later in the same year to discourage the hostile tribes from taking advantage of this setback and to prevent morale from suffering. As Tacitus describes the situation, AD 16 supposedly ended with the Romans in a state of elation and Germanicus believing that with one more year he could complete the conquest as far as the Elbe. Tiberius thought otherwise. It was clear to him that further armed intervention would in fact achieve a little, since the defeated enemy had an amazing capacity for regroup and to return as vigorous as before. Germanicus, he decided, would have to be recalled. This need not mean that Tiberius was jealous of his stepson's achievements, as Tacitus suggests. From the onset, a cautious strategist like Tiberius must have understood that Germanicus's policy was doomed to fail. He rightly appreciated that the conquest of Germany would require a steady policy of pacification, with military settlements established in relative proximity and an extensive network of communications. This was the strategy that would work so well during the initial conquest of Britain. In Germany, it would have required an enormous outlay of men and material, more than he was willing to countenance. It is admittedly difficult to understand why Tiberius allowed two full years of campaigning but it must be remembered that Germanicus had been appointed to his German command, not by Tiberius, but by Augustus. The emperor was thus caught between due deference to the wishes of Augustus and the practical policy that his soldier's instinct demanded. Tiberius would have felt obliged, of course, to make every effort to ensure that the withdrawal could not be taken as a slight, and the most diplomatic way to achieve this was to adopt the posture that the war had been won, and that Germanicus had achieved signal, single success. The emperor wrote to him at the end of 16, suggesting that the best course of action would be to wait until the Germans fell out amongst themselves, as they inevitably would. He also suggested that if any further glory was to be won in Germany, Germanicus's stepbrother Drusus should be given his opportunity. There was no reason to think that Germanicus would have taken any offense at this last suggestion. His steadfast loyalty towards Tiberius throughout his career had no doubt been made easier by the complete impartiality that the emperor seems to have maintained in his treatment of the two young men, cum integrum inter duas iudicium tenusit. Although he had kept his judgment impartial between the pair. As Tacitus remarks, 
The situation was helped by the abiding and apparently genuine friendship between the two stepbrothers, a friendship that matched the earlier closeness between Tiberius and his brother Drusus. To Tacitus, Germanicus, and the younger Drusus were egregi, concords, in splendid harmony. And these close feelings would be strengthened by the fact that Drusus was married to Germanicus' sister, Livilla. We should accordingly treat with great caution the old claim that two rival parties organized themselves around the two young men. Germanicus returned to Rome a conquering hero on the 26th of May, 17th, 17. He celebrated, oh I see, on the 26th of May in the year 17, he celebrated a splendid triumph for his victories over the Cherusi, Chatti, and Agravari, and the other tribes west of the Elbe. There was a great procession of spoils and captives and reconstructions of mountains, rivers, and battles, and Tiberius distributed a largesse, a largesse of 300 sesterges each to the people. What moved the spectators most, however, was the noble impression made by Germanicus, who rode in a chariot with his five children. Caligula was now almost five years old. This triumph, with himself at the center of an adoring populace, must have remained as one of his earliest and most vivid childhood impressions. Germanicus was kept busy for much of the remainder of the year in various functions. He dedicated the restoration of the ancient temple of space, entered a chariot in the Olympic Games, and was an active patron in Rome for private individuals and communities. Space, spelled S-P-E-S. -E Yet none of this, even combined with the promise of the consulship in the following year, as Tiberius's colleague would have seemed adequate compensation for his loss of command in Germany. But Tiberius had a plum to offer, the leadership of an important mission to the east. A number of serious problems had arisen there, in particular the threat of a clash with Parthia. Through much of her recent history, through much of her recent history, Rome had found herself at constant loggerheads with this great kingdom located between the Euphrates and the Indus. The main area of concentration was Armenia, a mountainous country east of the Euphrates, bordering on the NW of Parthia. The area west of the Euphrates was defined by the Romans as Armenia Minor. The Parthians had a long-standing claim on Armenia, which ran counter to Rome's desire to maintain the area as a protectorate. By 17, Armenia was without a king, and both Rome and Parthia would be anxious to secure a ruler well disposed to them, apart from this thorny issue. There were other problems to be dealt with. Archelaus, king of Cappadocia in Asia Minor, had been summoned to Rome by Tiberius and accused of treason. He was not convicted. There may not even have been a trial. But he died before he could return to his kingdom, perhaps in 17. The status of his former domain was in a kind of limbo. At about the same time, two other rulers in Asia Minor died, Antiochus III of Comagne, or that would be Comagene, spelt C-O-M-M-A-G-E-N-E, -E. you work it out yourself, and Philopater or Philopater II, who ruled the Amanus in Cilicia. Comagene posed particular problems as a major section of the nobility desired annexation by Rome, 
while the general population remained loyal to the old dynasty, and both sides sent deputations to Rome. Tiberius argued in the Senate that the problems needed the presence of a figure like Germanicus, since he was himself too old and his son Drusus was too young. These comments were not misplaced, since whatever his deficiencies as a military commander, Germanicus possessed real talents as a diplomat. He set off on his mission in the autumn of AD 17, accompanied by Agrippina, Caligula, and a large retinue. It is possible that the occasion is recorded on the famous gem, the Grand Cammi, now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. This splendid piece has been much discussed for well over a century, and there is no clear consensus on what it depicts. Many scholars believe, however, that the gem represents the departure of Germanicus on his mission to the east. According to his view, the central figure is the enthroned Tiberius, who bestows the task on Germanicus, who faces him accoutred in battle armor. Behind Germanicus stands Agrippina and the young Caligula. Finally, Final certainty on the scene is, of course, impossible, and even if it does represent the departure of Germanicus, the cameo may well have been engraved some years after the event. You know, I, I've, I've, just a personal note, I've often wondered why scholars do this. Like, okay, what language are we reading this book in? English, correct? Right? Now, why, when it comes to things like the cameo in question, that famous cameo with Augustus in the central, it, it, some people have seen it, some people, well, what, why, right, why would they, why would they still, in, why, why not call it the grand cameo instead of the grand cami, now in the bibliothèque, you know, nationale in Paris? Like, why? Why, why not translate those titles as well? I don't understand that. There's no point in that. If it's an English text you're reading in, then make it English. I'm sorry. I, <clears throat> just, I, I, I don't know. Moving on. This isn't, this isn't particular to Barrett. Don't, uh, by any means. Like, it's just, it's all through. Scholarship, scholarship, scholastics. I, I, I don't understand it. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe that's the problem. I, I just I don't see the point. Like if you're going to translate, translate, not impart. Translate. Anyway, moving on. Germanicus's journey resembled a splendid triumphal procession as cities competed to outdo each other in the richness of their welcome. He first visited his stepbrother Drusus in Dalmatia, then proceeded to Nicopolis, the city founded by Augustus near Actium. He spent some days there and visited the bay where the great battle had taken place. He was in Nicopolis when he entered his second consulship in 18. He then went to Athens where he displayed his full talents as a diplomat, entertaining the city with only one lictor in deference to its status as a civitas libera. He dressed in Greek clothes and sandals and lavished compliments on the citizens, who in turn heaped honors upon him. From Athens he sailed to Euboea, then Lesbos, where Agrippina gave birth to the last of her children, Julia La Villa. Agrippina, no doubt, stayed in Lesbos when Germanicus, accompanied by Caligula, set off on a grand tour of northwest Asia Minor. They visited Perinthus 
and Byzantium, then passed through the Bosphorus to the mouth of the Black Sea. A planned visit to Samothrace on the return journey was prevented by unfavorable winds. Instead, they went to the Trode, visiting the site of Troy and the city of Asos. Later, on Caligula's accession, the people of Asos were keen to remind him of his visit with his father, and sent the new emperor a decree of loyalty. It seems that Caligula, yielding nothing to his father in diplomatic charm, had made some sort of address to them, although hardly six years old. The Asos decree preserved in an inscription asked him to care for the city, as he had promised when he first came with the, his father, Germanicus. This is the first recorded demonstration of Caligula's considerable oratorial skill. To what extent he owned his precocious ability to his father is uncertain, as Germanicus was dead before the boy entered his truly formative years. But this early incident, even allowing for the inevitable rhetorical exaggeration, does suggest that Germanicus might have fostered his son's talents in this area. See page 48. From Asos, father and son continued along the coast of Asia, visiting the oracle of Apollo at Colophon. At some point they rejoined Agrippina, and the new daughter, and the whole family continued the journey east, for we next hear of them in Rhodes, where they encountered Gnaeus Calpurnius. Piso, on his way to Syria, oh come on, excuse me, let's back up there again and repeat. At some point they rejoined Agrippina, and the new daughter, and the whole family continued the journey east, for we next hear of them in Rhodes, where they encountered Gnaeus Colpurnius Piso on his way to Syria. Piso had been appointed with the approval of the Senate to replace Cilius Criticus Silanus as the new governor of the province. Piso was a man of rough tongue and bloody-minded independence, Reluctant, if we are to believe Tacitus, to yield first place even to Tiberius. It is very likely that Tiberius had at the back of his mind the idea that he would impose some restraint on Germanicus, but it seems unlikely that Piso had been given more sinister instructions from the emperor deliberately to embarrass the mission, as Tacitus seems to imply. Piso had traveled first to Athens. He lacked Germanicus's tact and chose to insult the inhabitants as dregs, a quite different nation from the great Athenians of old, and criticized Germanicus for lavishing praise on what was little more than a rabble. Once settled in Syria, according to Tacitus, he sought to ingratiate himself with the legions by distributing bribes and relaxing discipline. His wife, Munatia Plencina, was also active. She lost no opportunity to insult Agrippina, while at the same time apparently trying to emulate her, riding in the cavalry exercises and taking part in the maneuvers of the cohorts. If Germanicus was aware of what was happening behind his back, he did not allow it to interfere with his mission. He proceeded straight to Armenia, where he established as king Zeno, the son of Polemo, the late king of Pontus. Zeno, who adopted the Armenian name Artaxias, proved higher Zeno, who adopted the Armenian name Artaxias, proved highly popular among his new subjects and ruled for 16 years with the 
apparent acquiescence of Parthia. Other problems in Asia Minor were also dealt with. Quintus Varanius was sent to organize Cappadocia, which was turned into a province under an equestrian governor. Archelaus, son, was allowed to retain a small part of the original kingdom in rough Cilicia. The revenues that accrued to Rome from Cappadocia proved so lucrative that Tiberius was able to reduce the 1% sales tax imposed throughout the empire by Augustus after the civil wars to 5%. Commagene was organized by Quintus Servius, who remained for a time as proprietor. It was later incorporated into Syria. There is no information on the fate of Philopater's kingdom in Sicilia, or Philopater's, if you wish, which may similarly have been swallowed up by Syria. Once these administrative problems had been settled, Germanicus, in late 18, made for Syria, where he had his first formal meeting with Piso at Cyrus in the camp of Legio X, 10th Legion. It was a cool encounter, as earlier in the year Germanicus had instructed Piso that he, or his son, should take a detachment of troops to Armenia, and Piso had simply ignored the order. From now on, whenever they met, there was friction. One anecdote illustrates the strain between the two men. When Aretas, the king of the Nabataeans, gave a banquet, heavy gold crowns were presented to Germanicus and Agrippina, lesser ones to Piso and others. In a fit of pique, Piso threw the one offered to him to the floor, declaring that the banquet was supposedly intended for the son of a Roman princeps, and not a king of Parthia. He then launched into an attack on luxurious living, listened to by a furiously silent Germanicus. In the winter of 1819, Germanicus visited Egypt partly for administrative purposes, partly to see the antiquities, presumably taking his son with him. He was received rapturously in Alexandria, and from there took a trip up the Nile, first visiting Thebes, where he took a keen interest in the extant inscriptions, then the great colossus of Memnon, the Pyramids, Lake Mores, and finally Syene the southern limit of the Roman Empire. When he returned to Alexandria, he was to find a rebuke from Tiberius awaiting him. The emperor had written to remind him that Augustus had prohibited senators from visiting Egypt without permission. The prohibition arose from Egypt's enormous importance as grain supplier but in Germanicus's case was little more than a breach of protocol rather than any fear of that he had designs on the province. Tiberius clearly felt that his stepson was perhaps beginning to forget his place and needed to be curbed, if only for his own good. On his return to Syria, Germanicus and Piso found that disagreement over the respective mandates made effective collaboration impossible. They clashed violently, and Piso decided it would be prudent for him to leave. His preparations were cut short, however, by news that Germanicus had fallen seriously ill. He bided his time in Seleucia to await events. Germanicus was convinced that Piso had poisoned him in collusion with his wife and the discovery of spells and curses and evidence of witchcraft straightened his conviction. Piso was finally ordered out of the province completely. He set sail and had reached the island of Kaz when news arrived that Germanicus had succumbed to, his, to the illness. 
Germanicus died in Antioch on the 10th of October, year 19, at the age of 33. It is quite possible there was nothing sinister about his death. Syria was a notoriously unhealthy spot, and about a century later, Trajan was to die from a disease contracted there. What? Agrippina herself was ill before she left, and even Martina, the suspected poisoner, died at Brundisium on her way back. But Germanicus had been convinced that he was being murdered, and before his death asked his entourage to ensure that Piso and his wife's villainy be brought to account. He also left telling instructions for Agrippina that she was to put aside her pride and to avoid provoking those more powerful than herself in her own drive for power. His funeral was held at Antioch. The body being exposed before cremation to show proof of poisoning. Finally, Agrippina, worn out and ill, but determined on revenge, set sail for Italy. Personal footnote. That's curious. If anyone has any ideas what that could be, please leave it in the comments um, where it's suggested here that the body being exposed before cremation that they, you know, they exposed it before cremation to show proof of poisoning. What sort of proof would that be? And they say show, so it would be something visual? What would that be? Any ideas? Let us know. The lingering death of Germanicus had caused tensions to rise in Rome. The first reports caused an outbreak of hatred against Tiberius and Livia and suspicions that they had plotted the murder along with Piso and his wife, the reported motive being their supposed fear that the if Germanicus had come to power, he would have restored the Republican constitution, the temporary jubilation caused by a false report that he had survived only deepened the grief when it was shown to be untrue, and intensified popular sympathy for Agrippina and hostility towards Tiberius and Piso. Numerous honors were voted, Germanicus, recorded by Tacitus, and an inscriptions found in Etruria and Spain. Suetonius gives an even more vivid picture of the reaction to his death outside of Rome, perhaps of limited historical importance in itself, but useful in showing the kind of legend that grew around Germanicus, one which Caligula was able later to exploit. Barbarian nations were, we are told, at war with Rome, or with one another, sought Truces, foreign kings removed their beards and shaved their wives' heads, and even the king of Parthia interrupted his hunting and banquets. Meanwhile, Agrippina, sailing through the winter season, had by early twenty reached Corsaira. She lingered there to regain her spirits and presumably to ensure that news of her imminent arrival would precede her to Italy and ensure a lively reception. Finally, she reached Brundisium, and as she entered the harbor, every spot that commanded a view of the sea was occupied. The crowds watched as she disembarked, carrying the urn with Germanicus's ashes, and clutching little Caligula and her sister. Two cohorts of the Praetorian Guard escorted the urn on its journey to Rome, carried on the shoulders of tribunes and centurions, the magistrates of Calabria, Apulia, and Campania were ordered to honor the ashes as they passed through their districts, and in every town they passed through the people, donned mourning, and burned incense. Germanicus's brother Claudius, along with his stepbrother Drusus, together with the rest of his children, met the cortege at Terracina, and as it made its way into the city, 
the consuls and members of the senate as well as ordinary people went out to meet it in a great public ceremony the ashes were laid in a mausoleum of augustus and that the general population might have lamented that the republic had now perished and all hope was dead would have been troubled enough would have been troubling enough for tiberius but what must have rankled most was the outburst of popular feeling for agrippina who was called the dicus petrii solum augusti sangu inum unicum antiquitis specimum the glory of her country the last of augustus's line an unmatched example of ancient virtues why not just say that why not just say that <laughs> sorry anyway i don't know it's just my um, shortcomings concerning the latin we all know it <laughs> tiberius livia and antonia did not attend the funeral we are not told the reason tiberius in character sought to keep the tragedy in perspective and issued a declaration that many illustrious romans had died for their country though none had been so deeply mourned he reminded the people of the other losses that the imperial family had suffered over the years observing that men were mortal only the state was immortal tiberius's observations may have been well founded but they were not likely to win him friends nor did this subsequent trial and suicide of piso change feelings tiberius's desire to keep the proceedings impartial was bound to be misconstrued nor did his intervention on behalf of plancina at the request of his mother help matters since it simply confirmed a popular suspicion that he and livia had been involved in germanicus's death and it's aggravated the fear of optimus quisque all decent people in brackets that the same poisons would now be turned against agrippina and her children germanicus had been a man of worthy but not outstanding achievements he was in fact much more important in death than in life his untimely end provided a focus for the ill feelings towards tiberius and created a legend of superhuman qualities which no doubt with some external maneuvering were to be transferred in the popular mind to caligula germanicus's death in syria in ad 19 marked the first stage in the process that would bring his son to the throne some 18 years later 